because that's kind of important. Okay. All right. Welcome to week four. We are going to talk more about database design this week, uh, more focusing on the physical design of things, considerations and whatnot for physical design. Um, yeah. So I'm going to talk about resolving relationships. Specifically, we're going to talk about many to many. Uh, we're going to talk about the design process, uh, data types, and then natural versus synthetic keys. So resolving relationships. In one-on-one -on -one relationships, there's nothing to resolve um, because literally you got one-to-one. -one. There's no magic happening there. The biggest decision you have to make when you're resolving those relationships is you have to decide where the foreign key is going to be because if it's one-to-one, -one, the foreign key can live in either table. You just have to decide which one's going to be you know, the controlling entity of the two. It makes no difference which way they go. You just have to pick one. You don't have foreign keys in both because that's not good. You just pick one as a as the source. Um, one to many, it's optional to resolve and what uh, to resolve. It's optional to resolve in most cases. Um, you usually don't resolve a many to many into a one to one relationship because you're probably going to lose information. Um, normally, one to many is self contained. Many to many. Uh, resolving is almost always a desirable. Um, I promised myself I'd update this slide last semester and get rid of the word almost. And uh, apparently I did not. Many, many must always be resolved. Why? Because most database servers, and by most I'm talking like 95% or more, cannot actually handle a many to many relationship inside itself. Some of you have already had the experience in MySQL Workbench when you pick many to many. You click on the two tables and poof, a third table magically shows up to the party. That's because MySQL cannot handle many to many. Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, IBM DB2, uh, Teradata, none of them can handle many to many. It's physically impossible for them to do it. So when we have many to many, what's happening is we have two lists with duplicated data on both sides and you can't ask questions like in this case how many orders have been made how many products did we sell we couldn't really tell because everything's related to everything else what we need to do is we're going to add an associative entity so we take what's on the screen oh no battery just died all right button was pressed okay so you got a student subjects many to many what you, how you resolve it is by creating a table in the middle. I talked about that last week, I'm pretty sure, or two weeks ago. Um, so essentially you resolve it many, many by creating a, a bridge table, an associative entity, an intersection, intersect table. There's multiple names for this. They all do the same thing. Um, it's literally just a choice of nomenclature depending on what um, the tables offer. The way you create it is you put in the four keys. In this case, you've got a student subject and that middle table should actually be called student subject. Um, you will take the primary keys from both tables, bring them to the child table. Those primary keys are also becoming foreign keys and primary keys. I'm just gonna draw it on the board so it's a little clearer. If you got student, subject, and we have student, subject, like this, student number, name, Subject, number, description,
and this is our primary key. When you bring it down, like such, The relationships go like this. And in here, you'd have the two foreign keys. Like such. And This is what that slide's trying to demonstrate, but it's uh, this one's actually showing you what the keys are properly. So when you create this table, which is known as an associative entity, or an intersection table, or a bridge table, or depending on what other systems you're using, it's been called a has and belongs to many table, just all kinds of names for the same thing, uh, you'll have the primary keys of the other two tables come in as foreign keys, but they're also participating in the primary key. So you have a compound primary slash foreign key. That's how you resolve many to many. It's pretty straightforward. Um, and like I said, this is known as a, an intersection table or an intersect entity. Um, it can be known as a social entity when you add extra columns in here. So if you add extra columns in this table, it suddenly becomes, it's no longer an intersection, then it's an associative. But none of the slides talk about that. So not important, it's just a piece of trivia for you. Okay. So that's resolving the many-to-many -many relationship. Now I'm gonna talk about the database design process. So database design is an iterative process. It means you do each of the steps, you go back to the beginning, do all the steps again, over and over and over again. There is no perfect design. That's something you have to accept right off the bat. When you start doing database design, there's no such thing as a perfect design. There will always be compromises. The second you try to reach perfection, you probably made it overcomplicated. Uh, years ago, I decided to run an exercise with a different group of students. Uh, it wasn't for this course, it's a different course. And I decided to let them just go nuts on a database design as a group. And we were doing a pet adoption type setup. So, you know, everybody's throwing out their ideas. We ended up with 72 tables because people kept throwing things, ideas of things they should, they think was important. By the end, we could have mapped bus routes based on when somebody was adopting a pet. It wasn't quite that bad, but it was pretty bad. It got to the point where half the ideas weren't even part of the business scope. But I said, give me your ideas, and away they went. Would it have been an awesome database? Yes. Would it have been a nightmare to maintain? Absolutely. Was most of the data irrelevant? Yes. It was just an example of if you try to go for perfection and try to cover every single possible use case scenario, it's not going to work. You just have to figure out what's going to work for what you're trying to do and you stop. Um, I don't know if anybody here has ever been in the habit of just going too far when you're doing things, like overthinking your projects or, and then suddenly you discover that you did too much. That's something you've got to learn to curb. So the design process is made up of four steps and a review. So the four steps are identify, describe, define the relationships, normalize, and review. Identification. Believe it or not, this is the most interesting part of all of this. Depending on the source of data, there's two common paths. There's a few other ways that this happens. 
But the two most common paths you'll have is a recreation slash reverse engineering. So you've been given a bit pile of data and you've been told to make it work. So you have data, you have structures, you might have forms, you might have paperwork, you might have all kinds of pieces of documentation. And your job is to take that and turn it into something useful. Or you've got two or three older databases that need to be brought together because over the years, you know, things grow hairy and you need to fix them. So that's path one. Path one tends to be the most straightforward of the two paths because you already know what you're working with. You're just cleaning up. Path two, the clean room implementation. That's when your boss goes on vacation and comes back three weeks later with a head full of ideas and says, I've got it. I want you to create a database to do X, Y, Z. And that's it. You have no other sources of information other than an idea. It's known as a clean room implementation, also known as a whiteboard implementation, because odds are you're going to start on a whiteboard or on a piece of paper or whatever. It's, it's known as clean room because you're not coming in with any preconceived concepts of anything. Um, so path two is really good for creative types because you're not constrained by existing information. Um, if you're not very creative, path two might be painful. Depends on your personality. However, both paths have a very common set of steps. You try to identify all the possible gross data objects, also known as entities. So users, customers, orders, whatever. And you list the objects, you categorize them. Now that the, each of the objects have been identified, you try to add all the basic fields. So you're gonna add a primary key, descriptor fields, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, if we go back to thinking about students as an object type, you know, you got a student number, you got a person's first name, last name, middle name, um, address, phone number, SIN number, passport number, student visa number, home mailing address, home phone number, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, program of study. There's all these things that a student has to describe them. So we try to identify as much of this as possible. Then you take a bit of time, you try to assign some data types to them. And I'll be talking about data types in a few minutes. Then you create the relationships. So then you go, hey, I know for a fact we have courses and students, subjects and students, and we try to figure out how they're related. Can a student take multiple courses? Yes. Can a course be taken by multiple students? Yes. What happens if there's more? students and there's room available in the course. Suddenly we need something called sections. Suddenly we have course, student, sections. We might have a term. There's another entity and we got to figure out what the relate, how everything's interrelated with each other. And then you create the foreign keys as applicable. Um, and obviously if you're working in a shop with naming conventions, you're going to follow their rules. Then you normalize. That's what we talked about last week. So. You may want to look at your entities and see if you've got any uh, anomalies in them, because at first, when you're just throwing ideas up, you know, throwing stuff at the board and seeing what sticks, uh, you may end up with garbage data. So you'll want to normalize. Um, as a reminder, a non-official description of the normal forms is a uh, table should have no repeating fields. It has a primary key and is organized in rows. Um, and the second normal form is all data and tables have correlated primary keys and must depend on the whole key, also known as no partial dependencies. And third normal form, uh, there's no transitive dependencies. Therefore, all the data must rely on the primary key. Um, you may need to create reference tables at this point. Um, reference tables, for those of you guys who don't know what those are, those are tables used for dropdowns. You know when you're you're filling out forms online, you have drop downs with set options where you're not allowed to type stuff in. 
Usually that comes from a reference table, also known as a lookup table. Common examples are a person's title, you know, Mr., Mrs., Doctor, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, countries, political regions, varying other type of things you might find in a drop down. You create those as needed. Um, I'll give you guys a really important concept in user interface design. Never let, it, let anybody type anything in as much as possible. Make them pick from existing options whenever possible. Why? Yeah, I can give an example of why you'd create a reference table. So years ago, when I started at my previous company, which would have been 24 years almost ago, they had a website. The internet was fairly new back then. So a lot of the concepts weren't being applied like they are now. And they had a customer registration form. They had free form text fields for state or province. They had a free form text field for country. Did you know Americans have at least five ways of putting in the name of their country? United States, United States of America, USA, U.S.S. Dot S, dot, with USA with dots. Uh, there's actually, I've seen a couple of other flavors. Then we got the provinces, Ontario, O-N, O-N-T. And then you get the new fees where you had NL, NFLD depending on whose mood they were in. Um, so when it was time to run reports, they wanted to know everybody that was in the U.S. I had to figure out every stupid way a person wrote United States in a freeform text field. That wasn't even counting typos. And then I had to build a big, giant, fat wear clause that collected all the different flavors of United States. One of the very first things I did was change that so that they pulled it from a drop down so that it was consistent. Um, so whenever you have a field that, yes. All right, so number one, never use enum. Okay, I'm just going to end it right there. Uh, why? Because it's not portable. It won't work. Like um, an enum in MySQL will not work in Postgres. Enum in Oracle is not the same as an enum in Microsoft SQL Server. If you know you're never going to change your database backend, go ahead and use an enum. Basically, an enum is an array. And when you define field as an enum, it actually allows only certain values to go into it ever. And if you want to change those values, you have to actually update the database structure. Normally, you would use a normal table with a primary key and sort of varchar column. Um, the one I like to use the example is the list of countries. Digital countries change names. Regularly? How many of you remember a country called Yugoslavia? I used to work with a guy from Yugoslavia. Does Yugoslavia still exist? How many countries are now where Yugoslavia was? Three to four, depending on who you ask. Because they're fighting over a little part of an area about the size of Toronto. <laughs> but if whether or not that should be a country. See, there's Kosovo and uh, Serbia, and there's like a chunk between them that they're not happy about. They're they're arguing where the line is. 
Yeah. So countries change names, countries come, countries go. If it's just a standard table, you can insert, update, and delete as required. And enum, you can't. So that's what I'm saying. Just stay away from enums. It's just going to cause you problems. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to be talking about data types in a minute. So it'll be interesting. So the goal is you want to get to third normal form as much as possible. If you have, actually, I meant to go back to the reference table. If you have a column that really should be a reference table, you replace that text column with a key, foreign key. So if you had a structure of, you know, name, address, city, province, postal code, country, odds are the province of the country will become drop downs. Those will become foreign keys pointing at two reference tables. Often I have students say, hey, what about the city? Can't we put the city in as a drop down? Theoretically, yes. Do you know how many cities are around the world? Too many. And then you got countries that get a little strange with their geography of what is actually a city versus a political division. Japan's a good example of how their addresses are a little interesting. Or if you look at some of the countries in the Pacific, in the Pacific Ocean, the country is the city. Like there is no difference. There's not even postal codes. It's like a name of an island. Boom, mail goes to this island. Everybody knows everybody else. It's like the mailman just comes around and just starts throwing stuff at people. Mail comes like once a month. It's a big event. So you don't do things like city. You can use postal, postal lookups like they have now, like some of the websites you've seen where you can start punching an address and it does the filling in for you. That's cool. That helps keeps your data nice and clean. Uh, but the things like city will stay, stay text fields. Step five, you review. You review the design for potential issues. So at this point, normally what you want to do is try and find someone else to look at it. Why? Because more than one pair of eyes on a project is a good thing. Somebody else might bring in a perspective you did not think of. They might question why you did the design that way. Failing having a person to do database to help you with your design. And that's something I lived for years at my old job as the only database architect they had. What did I do at that point when I couldn't really ask anybody if my design made sense? Have you ever heard of a concept called rubber duck debugging? I had one person say yes. Rubber duck debugging, and there's a website for this, believe it or not, is you get yourself a little rubber duck or a fig or whatever you want. You sit it next to you and you explain your design process to your rubber duck. Literally, you talk to your rubber duck out loud and suddenly you'll say things in your rubber duck. You'll realize it's stupid, whatever you're saying. And suddenly, because you're explaining it to the duck, because the duck knows nothing, as you're explaining it, you'll start realizing your mistakes. It's great for finding bugs in your code, too, when you're know, going, my code runs, but it's not doing what it's supposed to do. You explain it to a rubber duck. By the time you're done explaining it to the rubber duck, you'll be going, oh, this loop is doing this, and then I have the conditional that does the, oh, wait, there it is. I, d I used to do the same thing. I had a little bobble I got in a box of cereal that just sat in the corner of my desk. So whenever I needed to figure things out, I'd just talk to my bobblehead. It was fun. It did the job. So after you've identified any weaknesses, you go back to step one, implement the changes, walk through, make sure you don't need to normalize, et cetera, et cetera, until it's good enough. So when you're doing this review process, you're also going to try to think down the road a little bit so you don't corner yourself. Um, as a person who has cornered himself in a database design a few times, uh, it really sucks having to fix that. Because not only are you fixing the database, you got to fix the applications. Releasing applications because you screwed up two years before is not a good time. Obviously, you can't see 100% down the road, but you don't want to limit yourself. Again, don't use enums. Because at one point, you might only have four or five choices, and suddenly you realize you need 10. Now you got enum issues. Um, and the last thing is you try not to over-engineer. Like, don't go too far. Because if you over-engineer, it's going to get over-complicated. And you're going to have a bad time. 
Um, that one I can give an example of, I've done. Uh, years ago, when I first started working in Ottawa, I worked for a company called Digital Equipment. Most of you have never heard of Digital Equipment. Um, they were one of the top five employers in Ottawa after he took out the government. They were huge. Um, how many of you have been to Canada? You know, on March Road, you got the corner of March Road and Herzberg, and there's all these buildings. Now there's a company called Abbott there. That that all belonged to Digital Equipment. Digital Equipment had a campus with a thousand employees in Hall. Uh, you know the big tall building just outside of here. So you go exit towards Woodruff, and you see the tall brown building that belonged to Digital. That's how many employees they had. Anyways. When I started, first started working there, they gave me a database to modernize and bring into the modern age. And I thought I was going to get clever. And I set primary keys that were semi-intelligent because I was kind of stupid back then. And I hadn't learned the hard way. So that when somebody looked up a ticket number, they could actually break down the number of the ticket to actually identify who the customer was based on the ticket number. And then they ran out of uh, customer numbers after I left, but they ran out of, somebody actually sent me, somebody who knew, still knew me there, they sent me an email, go, Dan, you're an ass hat. They didn't have to fire me, I was always working somewhere else at that point, but they ran out of customer numbers, and they had to update the database structure, and update the, the web-based application in front of it. It was a good time. Whatever. Just don't do, don't over-engineer. Don't try to get clever. KISS, the KISS principle, keep it simple. And insert your preferred S word after that. So review, think about the future, but don't overdo it. It's something you will learn with experience. There's no way for me to actually tell you guys, this is the line where you stop. You'll learn it yourselves. It just comes with experience. All right. You've created your database um, structure. You're happy. What's the next thing you do with it? You generate test data. Why do you generate test data? Because testing is important. I'm sure everybody in here writes perfect code and there's never been a bug and never a crash. Not once. So you guys don't need to test. But in the real world, you test. A lot. When you create your first database, you want to load it with test data because it'll give the developers something to work with. They don't need to create test data if you're doing it as part of your design process. You can also use it for load testing to test how good the database structure is under load. There's actually many sites that offer the service. Um, GeneratedData.com is still around for sure. Uh, Mockaroo was up, disappeared for a while, and came back, and I don't know what the status of it is right now. Um, free data generator was still there last I checked. Uh, I tend to use generatedata.com. Um, I use actually the old version of their site, not the new version of their site, because I could just download the whole PHP application then have Because their default version lets you generate 100 rows of data at a time, and I need to generate 100,000 rows of data at a time. Because I needed to load test. How do you load test? You make lots and lots of data. So I was generating 100,000 rows of data at a time. 100 times. I needed over a million rows to test. So I downloaded the old source code. You can still download it. That's a series of Docker containers and all kinds of stuff. It's really complicated. Uh, but it's actually really fancy uh, to play with. Um, if ever you want to generate test data that looks realistic, generatedata.com's got you. Um, actually. I'll pull it up really quick. I knew my uh, laptop was humming earlier. So, hey. Like that, let me just make this a little bit bigger. So you can actually generate all kinds of interesting data with this. Oh. 
like that. Now what's nifty is you can choose specific uh, regions. Um, and let me just close this. There we go. Hello. Based on the on the countries, Canada, United States, and the UK. Or you can tell it to actually use a country row, um, which is cool because you can say row eight. So when you generate the data, you'll see that it's actually generating the region based on the country. So the data looks real. Um, I'm going to change this so that it's actually a uh, HTML table for you. So you can actually, really? Uh, CSV? That's even worse. It's HTML. Um, you can see it's generating it, and you can get it to regenerate over and over and over again. And it always generates things that look realistic. Same thing with the postal code. Um, you can actually tell it to tie the, the country row. Did it take that? It doesn't like... Like that. And if I go preview, now we've got postal codes that match the countries. And what's cool, you can actually do it with the names so that the names sound regional. So, you know, names from an Asian country have Asian names. North American people have names like, you know, Chastity. The fun names. I've known a few of those. Yep. So, yeah, so you generate SQL. Uh, if you want, you can actually generate it as a Python array. It's got all kinds of cool features. Uh, you can, you guys started playing with JSON yet? There's your JSON array. So you can use this one tool to generate all kinds of data for yourself. It's handy. Um, really handy. And they've got some other nifty data types in here too, if you want to play with it. Um, rows. You want to do uh, credit cards, CVV numbers. It'll create fake credit cards. And um, if I turn that off, you can even tell it which kinds of credit cards you want it to generate for your testing. It's cool. They're not real data. They're not credit, real credit cards, but it will generate data. It looks really real for testing. So that's one of the reasons I really recommend using this kind of a tool instead of trying to generate this data yourself. Like it took me what? Five minutes as I was talking to generate real looking data. Yeah. The country row is when I'm defining region and postal code, I said, hey, base yourself on the row that contains a country. So it's saying row eight is the where my country is stored. So right now we got right here, it's the country right here. So it's actually basing itself on when it's generating data, it's doing an intelligent data generation. Um, same thing if I add a phone number, you can actually define what the format of the phone number looks like, which is nifty. And you can go North American phone numbers, uh, varying formats. I want, uh, French phone numbers and you can get it to generate data, whichever way you want. It's handy. In actual fact, half that wasn't there last time I used this tool. The guy's constantly updating the code, so it's a good one. All right, now I'm going to talk about data types as soon as I drink some water. All right. So when you're decide, picking your data types, you have to use a bit of thought process. So the common ones you'll see, and I'm only going to be talking about the generic data types uh, because every database server has their own 
special versions of things. Um, so I'm going to stick it to the generic ones for this. So we got car slash character. These are fixed length strings. They fixed length strings. They always occupy a defined amount of space. So if you create something as car six, it will always use six bytes in the database. If you only feed it one character, it'll pad it to six. It'll either put in six spaces or it'll put in six nulls, but it'll always occupy six bytes of space. Varkar, also known as character varying, depending on your database engine. It's a variable length string. It occupies the length of whatever you put inside of it plus one byte. So if you define something as a varkar 50 and you put in ABC, it'll occupy three bytes plus a little bit more. The little bit more is known as a terminator. So when the database is reading the data, it'll go A, B, C, oh, terminator, I'm done reading it now. So it doesn't need to read the last 48 char 47 characters. It just hits those three and knows it's done. It takes up a lot less room. There's some history behind this. Way back in the day, car was the preferred data type because computers knew exactly how much to move the media to read the whole thing. So if you had an address defined as character 50, and we're talking the old computers with the tape to tape or the really slow hard drives, the software would know that, hey, I just read uh, the address. I now need to move the equivalent of 50 bytes over. It would actually move either the head on the hard drive over the equivalent of 50 bytes. It would move the tape over 50 bytes. Character types were fast because the software knew how much to move the media. But can anybody think about what the downside of that would be? Anybody think what would be the problem with things that are fixed length that always occupy the maximum amount of space defined to it? Yeah. Right. So, yes. But when we're talking about wasting space, let's think back 30 years when this stuff was first being designed. How big were hard drives 30 years ago? Not very. I had a hard drive on my Commodore 64. I bought it used for $600. It was 10 megabytes. It held the entirety of all my floppies. 10 megabytes is not very big. By modern standards, it's three pictures on my Samsung Galaxy. Back then, I had my entire OS and every game I owned and every other piece of software I owned, and I still had room left. So if you are wasting 10 bytes on every address, eventually that 10 megabytes goes away pretty quick. So some really clever people came up with Varkar fields so that you could define something as Varkar 50, but maybe you only occupy three or four or five bytes as applicable. So you could design a little bit bigger than you needed for the future while not wasting space in the present. <clears throat> Modern database engines have gotten very efficient. Varkars are just as fast, if not faster than the text because they're optimizing for Varkar. There's very little reason to ever use a text data type unless you were ever going to put in one or two characters. Or you're going to put in a postal code. So in Canada, you put in character six because you always need six characters for a postal code. If you're the Americans and you do something stupid, like decide to use five digits and run out of postal codes, you can't use five characters. If ever you have ever wondered why some American postal codes have an extra dash and a bunch of numbers behind it, it's because they ran out of postal codes. You could have a single postal code that was for a million people. Think of Manhattan, for example, the island of Manhattan. One American postal code could cover close to a million and a half people. So they had to create postal code extensions, routing codes. Var card for postal code, just, just say. You know, you never know. Um, text types. Text is used to store large chunks of text. Every other database engine other than MySQL has a text type that is basically unlimited. Postgres is a good example. 
you can drop a piece of text into a text field for the maximum size of a file on the disk. A single text field in Postgres could theoretically hold the entirety of the Wikipedia if you wanted to do that yourself. Not a good idea, but you could do it if you wanted to. MySQL, on the other hand, has three text types, small text, text, and big text. Small text is 255 characters. Uh, medium text is something like, uh, if I remember, it's something like 30,000 characters, and then big text is like what everybody else has. You have to be careful with text data types. They're hard to index. They don't perform very well when you index them. Imagine you're trying to index an entire textbook for quick lookups. I'll be talking about indexes like next week, I think. Text takes up their pigs to deal with. Yeah, they actually make special index types for those. So you don't normally index them. That's where I'm trying to get at. Number types. So we have the common ones, integers. You guys should all know what an integer is by now, right? Yeah, it's a whole number with no decimal places. Database servers are kind of clever. They give you different choices of them. They'll call them slightly different things, but they basically offer all these things. Integer, standard integer, which also can be abbreviated to int. We have a small integer, a tiny integer. Tiny integer is a MySQL specific one. Um, it's basically a one byte integer. It's fine. You got medium integer and big integer. Uh, depending on the database engine, the big integer is like a stupidly long number, like 14 or 15 digits. Um, you got decimal and numeric. They're the same thing. Some database servers call it decimal, some call it numeric. It is the best data type for money. Um, did your prof last semester actually explain to you what the data types do? No? Okay, I'll take that as a no. Decimal and numeric is probably one of the most useful data types you'll ever use. So if you define something as ten comma two. This allows you to store this. So if you define something as either decimal or numeric, it's the same. They're aliases to each other. 10 comma 2 means you're allowed to store 10 digits total. Two are reserved for decimal places. It's good for money. Normally, if you're doing actual money, you'd actually go, just, just saying, you'd normally go uh, three decimal places. Uh, why? Rounding errors. You just want to avoid rounding errors, so that's what that's good for. Um, this allows you to represent the data the way it really is. Yes. As two separate columns. So every time you you want to look up the total of a line, you'd have to do the math. Math bad. Right, so let's do some foreign exchange right now. What's the exchange rate? I don't know what the exchange rate right now. Let's say the exchange rate is uh, A. 
Canadian to U.S. dollars. I think it's about a but it's about a buck, a buck for thirty-eight roughly. But most banks track it to three decimal places. So how are you going to handle that? With sometimes you'll have two decimal places, some you have three decimal places, because when you round and they store it in the accounting system, we actually store it to three decimal places of pennies for precision. So when there's rounding up, when the money gets added up and rounded, it's more accurate. Um, they'll display only two digits, but they usually store three or four. So that's why you don't store it as pennies in an, as an integer field. Um, what's cool about this, the other feature that's cool about this, it does the rounding for you. So if you were to go to put something dot, you know, one, five, four, six, it'll do the rounding for you automatically. Because you know what humans are really bad at? Math and rounding. Um, it always shocks me that I have first level, you guys are level twos, but I have level one students that don't know how to round. Apparently they got all the way through high school and they don't know how to round a number. And it's getting worse. <laughs> so, yeah. Then we have float and doubles. Those are for when you need a lot of decimal places. Then the other question somebody says, well, why don't you store the money as a float or a, or a double? Why do you need a million decimal places? You don't need to track money that precisely. It's for ma it's for scientific application and mathematic applications. Um, then we have the bit. Uh, not everything has bit. Bit is some also known as a sometimes known as a boolean. which means it's on or off. Um, the problem with bit is sometimes it's actually a byte. So it's actually zero to nine. Um, yeah, I, my SQL is weird that way. Because the other issue we have is, does it's not on these slides, my SQL does not have a Boolean data type. There's no such thing as a Boolean in my SQL. So every other database server has a Boolean. Data type. Booleans are cool. Most people think of Booleans as yes or no. But don't forget in databases, we have a third option. Null. Yes, no, I don't know. So in databases, unless you make the Boolean not null, it's actually known as a tri-state Boolean, which is kind of defeating the point of a Boolean, right? Because it has one more value. In MySQL, on the other hand, our Booleans have and actually, they just changed this, and I don't even know what they've done with it. We had to use a tiny int as our Boolean field with a display length of one, which meant that our Booleans had no and nine shades of yes. So you had one to nine, like yes, no, yes, and a bunch of maybes, I guess. It's great. Um, if you have a database server that supports Booleans, please use Booleans. If you're on MySQL, you're using a tiny int, you're going to accept the fact that you might have uh, no and at least you know nine versions of yes. Then we have date, date types. We have date. Guess what that holds? A date. We have time. That holds just a time. Um, we have date time, which holds the date and a time. Okay, it comes as a shock to people, but, you know. Now, here we have a line that says timestamp. That depends on your database engine. MySQL has a timestamp. It's a special kind of field. A timestamp in MySQL means, when was the last time was this record touched? It will always update to the last time it got updated or inserted. You don't get to control what's in that. It's like a logging value. Every other database server that has a timestamp field is a year, month, day, hour, minute, seconds, precision, time zone added in. So you always know when around the world that time was set. Because most database servers run on GMT, Greenwich Mean Time also known as the time in ink in the UK, because that's where Greenwich is, where, you know, the um, time zones start going around from there. 
So timestamps and everything about MySQL respect time zones. MySQL timestamps don't have time zones. It is what it is. You accept it for what it is. Uh, we also have a year type. Yay, we can store a year. And if it's just a year, I mean, might as well use an integer for that. But, you know, it is what it is. Um, other cool data types that are not included in here that you'll find in some database servers, interval. Interval is the shit. Well, let's just say you have, you need to know how long something took, but you don't care about when it started or when it ended. So in MySQL, which does not have intervals, at least it didn't as of two years ago, last time I checked, and it doesn't change that often. If you want to know how long something took, you would start store the starting timestamp, the ending timestamp, then you'd subtract them and that would tell you how long something took. Database servers such as Oracle, Postgres, Microsoft SQL Server have a data co type called interval. How long did something take? You just store the span of time it took. Some people here are probably going, why would you need to know that? Scientists care a lot. How long did it take for something to fail? How long did it take 1,000 tests? What was the average amount of time something took to finish? <laughs> Without needing to know the start and end times. Yes. But can a numbers a little hard? It can be challenging to convert to other data types. Or milliseconds, or microseconds, or hours, or what type do you want? Do you have to do math to convert it into something else? Or do you let the database server do the math? Right, so if you store it as a num as a big fat integer, or even a float, because you need that much precision, when you go to display it, you're gonna have to do all the math to convert it into the right format. With a good database server that supports intervals, you can tell it, give me the interval in hours. You get the server to do the math for you but you didn't have to program it. Because you know what humans are bad at? Math. <laughs> Somebody took the time to program it, why not leverage the tools you have? Scientists, when you're designing a database of scientists, my throat's starting to go on me. When you design a database for scientists, you want your data to be as close to the real thing as possible. So if the, all they care about is length of time, you store an interval. You don't need to store anything else, just the length of time. And then two weeks later, they ask you to track also how long, when it started, when it ended, but you know, realistically, you store it all. All right. So those are the common data types. Um, other database servers have also have other cool data types. Um, for example, I'll use Postgres as an example, because that's the database server I've worked with the most over the years. Um, Postgres has geometry types. You can store a circle in Postgres by feeding it uh, X, Y, R. Give it three numbers, it knows exactly what that circle is. You can run a query about the sizes of circles if you want. You can store ellipses, squares, rectangles, di uh, triangles. You feed it the type, you feed it the coordinates, and it can draw it. It won't draw it on screen, but it knows how to do it. It has network types, such as an IP address. You can actually query parts of the octets, MAC addresses, um, other things like that. Um, if you turn on the GIS extensions, it's got the ability to store geographic data, which happens to be geometry. Um, there's tons of data types. Do you have to explore what your thing is? Now, if you're writing a system that you think needs to be portable, you gotta be careful because the features that MySQL has might not be in Postgres, might not be in Oracle. Or it should be the other way around, that what Oracle has and what Postgres has won't be in MySQL, but you know, it goes both ways. So when you choose your data types, you gotta take into consideration a few things. How big is the data? You don't want to over-engineer, but you don't want to, we don't want to come up short. Is it numeric? Does it need decimal places? Um, if it's a date, should you include the time? The answer is yes. 
I know you're you're chuckling. Realistically, when you talk about date date and time, there's a very few pieces of data where people don't care about the time. Date of birth is one of the few examples I can come up with that nobody cares what time you were born at except for your mother. But you hold it over your head for your whole life. Uh, another one would be start date of employment, end date of employment, that kind of stuff. Uh, but for almost everything else, you always include the time because if you don't include it and suddenly some you need to start querying on when the things happen and you don't have the data, you're screwed. Therefore, if it's going to be date, always include the time because when you run the query, you can always strip the time off at the display time so you can format it to just the date to make it look nice. Yep. Exactly. I mean, if you're going to occupy an extra two bytes for the time, take it. A good example, way back in the day, people used to have an ordering system. This is one I worked on uh, and I helped to port to a modern system where it literally had a field for date for when the date the order was ordered, the, the items were ordered. We didn't have the time because their stuff ran at night. Like people would put in the orders into the system. At night, they would all get batched up and processed and then all the orders would get shipped out the next day. They only cared about what happened during that one day. Suddenly they started modernizing and the manager said, so what time is most orders placed? And they're like, we don't know because we never collected that information. Well, somebody should have thought of that. Well, you go tell the guy who wrote this in COBOL 30 years ago. Because they were running on tape to tape and they didn't have room for the time, you know. But nowadays, always include the time because what is our busiest, busiest time of day is a question managers want to know. Whether they're running a McDonald's, it's an online ordering system where some unknown reason everybody orders their stuff at 9.15 at night for whatever reason. You're running a bar and you want to know when the peak sales for tequila is as opposed to the peak sales for vodka. Sounds like stupid questions, but you might be surprised at what you could do for uh, specials to pull people in during those times. Right? Always include the time. How big is the text? So can you fit it in a varkar field or should you use a text field? And the last item is just say no to blobs. So all database servers have a thing called blobs. They have it slightly different names for it. it. Stands for binary large objects. It basically allows you to store binary data in the database itself. Can anybody in here think why that's a bad idea? Uh, the size. Okay, we got a picture. Took a picture of my phone. It's three megabytes. Everybody thinking three megabytes is not big. Cool. We have a database that has clip art in it. Thousands upon thousands and thousands of pieces of clip art at three megabytes a piece. Suddenly our database is three terabytes because it's just full of binary data. Great. Now we need to do a backup. Guess what's going to be in the backup? All the binary data. So then your backup, and a backup is actually bigger than what's on a disk. Just so you know, whenever you run a backup, it actually occupies more room than what's on the disk in its native format. Because it has to be exported in a way that's safe to be brought into something else. Suddenly, your three terabytes might be 3.1 terabytes. And you're doing that every night. Normally you keep 14 days. How much data is that? Yeah. And you know what's really expensive? Storage. People think, oh, I got a terabyte hard drive. That's not, that's not expensive. When we're talking about SANS with, you know, 100 terabyte arrays or 200 terabyte arrays, it adds up. Um, what you normally do with a blob is you store the blob on disk and you just put the file name in the database. Maybe the whole path. Who cares? The path thing is nothing compared to the size of the file. That way, the files are backed up by the operating systems, backups, 
and the database is backed up like it normally would be. Database backups finish in a few minutes. File system backups are doing deltas every night so that they're being kept up to date. And you can do a restore at a point in time and everybody's happy. I've, in my entire career, I've only found one use for blobs. No, sorry, two uses for blobs. One, it the store escape characters in the database. The company I used to work for, we wrote printer drivers. That's one of the things we wrote were printer drivers. We created printer drivers for large format printers because the drivers from the people that make, made them were actually shittier than ours. Anybody here who's ever had an HP printer knows exactly what I'm talking about. I need to install a printer driver, 450 megabytes to print a file. And then you ran out of cyan, so you can't scan, right? So we'd write our own printer drivers, but a lot of printers use escape characters to tell that things are happening. We actually put our drivers in the database so we could actually generate drivers from the database and save versions of it without actually having to write C code for it. It was kind of nifty. We'd read the definition and then actually generate libraries. The other thing we had was we'd store international characters into a binary field for translations. When you use a blob, it stores it in its native byte format. I guarantee if somebody's pulling up Chinese, Japanese, Korean, um, insert other language here that has lots and lots of characters in their, can't call it an alphabet, in their written language. Like, I know Chinese occupies at least minimum two to four bytes per character. Whereas, you know, English, Cyrillic, you know, Latin languages basically have one character per byte, one character per byte, a lot of Asian languages have two to four bytes per character because they've got like 300 characters and the 400 characters in the alphabet plus all the little inflections on it. Or you've got other languages such as Japanese that have three different alphabets. Fun times. You can store them natively in a blob because it'll just put the raw bytes in the blob so you can pull them back out as it was. You don't need to worry about encoding it. You don't need to convert it. Take it as is, froom into the database, froom right back out of the database just the way it was. Those are the two uses I found in my career for blobs. Everything else, don't do it. You're just asking for trouble. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about keys. Synthetic versus natural keys. So quick reminder, composite keys, I had an example on the board earlier. A natural key. A natural key is a key based on attributes that already exist in the real world. Examples of this would be a SIN number or an SSN number, uh, a credit card, et cetera, et cetera. Those are natural keys. A synthetic key is a key that has no business meaning. They're also known as surrogate keys. A primary key, we know what that is. And the foreign key is, you know, we also know what that is. We talked about it lots. Okay. So issues, natural keys, and you can see there's a wall of text. So natural keys have a lot of issues. People don't realize just how many issues there are with using natural keys. One, the size. Surrogate keys are usually an integer. They're small. Natural keys will often be bigger and sometimes compound. So that means our keys are big. The bigger the key, the slower they are, the more room they occupy. The bigger the key, the less the indexes will perform. Foreign key size. If your primary key is fat, your foreign key has to match it. That means for, instead of storing the number one, and you're, so let's say you're using somebody's SIN number. Okay, and SIN number has nine digits. Always nine digits. It's actually stored as a character. Therefore, your primary key is nine characters. Your foreign key is nine characters. Oh, that just happens that this primary key is reused in four different tables. That means those nine characters are repeated four times. And each person has 16 records in four different tables. Suddenly we're at 16 times four. 
for one person of nine characters. On the other hand, integers are not are stored as bytes. They don't take up a lot. Like a single byte, which is eight characters, can hold, uh, well, I mean, five bits will do 32. 64, 128, 256 values on a single byte. You had two bytes, that number just grows exponentially. So they take up a lot less room. Aesthetics. So that was an eye of the beholder thing. Older, and by read the, by translate older into the crusty old men that designed all these databases back in the day. And I'm picking on the men here specifically. Um, liked using natural keys. Because it was pretty to them. Because it made sense. You looked at the data, it made sense. Yeah. Integers aren't as pretty, but they occupy a lot less room. They make it a lot simpler. Uh, issue number four and five, optionality applicability. Surrogate keys have no problems with people things not wanting to, to provide the data. For example, picture the school system here, where um, you have a student that refuses to provide their passport number because they don't have one, because they're Canadian. They don't need a passport to come here. But the system requires the passport. The person doesn't have a passport. And they're using the passport number as a primary key for whatever reason they decide to do that. If the person have a passport, they can't be added into the system if the passport's a primary key. Therefore, if it's a surrogate key, it doesn't give to, doesn't give to, doesn't care at all, right? You can choose what's actually important by using a surrogate key. Uniqueness. Um, surrogate keys are guaranteed to be unique. Foreign keys, I mean, natural keys, not so much. Um, true story. Here at Algonquin, originally, your student number, are you ready for this? Was your SIN number. We're talking 1970s here, okay? Because it made sense. In the 70s, people weren't worried about that stuff. It was a lot harder to steal somebody's identity in the 70s. Because you actually show up with your SIN card to actually you know, apply for stuff. So. so you used a SIN number. And then they had decided to open up the school to international students. Student comes in, they're going to use their student visa number. It actually had a conflict with a SIN number. They couldn't put the student in because they had a conflict because it wasn't unique. Fun times. Um, so uniqueness is a risk. Foreign key, surrogate keys are always unique because the numbers go up and they never get reused. Privacy. Back to the SIN number. If you're using something like a SIN number as your primary key, everybody gets to see it. Maybe you don't want to have that as your primary key so that, you know, Debbie, the receptionist, doesn't see everybody's SIN numbers. Accidental denormalization. Um, you can't denormalize non-business data. Um, it's not something that happens very often, but it's a risk. Cascading updates. Surrogate keys never changed. Therefore, you have to worry about how to cascade the updates. So, SIN numbers can change in Canada. You get identity stolen. You go to Service Canada desk and you apply for a new SIN number because your identity was stolen. That means your SIN numbers are going to change. You go to the bank, give them your new SIN number. The system has to cascade update everywhere where the SIN numbers are. The big problem is, is that your SIN number is used as a primary key and a foreign key. The foreign key rule states that it has to be a value that's in the table, but you just change that value. Now, you can't update the foreign key and the pair, the, the source key, like the primary key and the foreign key suddenly get into conflict because 
you're trying to update the primary key, but you have to change the child key at the same time, which you can't change two things at the same time, so you're going to change the child key. But you can't change the child key because it doesn't exist in the parent. Catch-22. You can't update something that doesn't exist, and you can't update to something that's already there. You, you'll have no link, and therefore, the second you break the link, the database server stops says you're not allowed to do this. So you try to change the children, it won't let you because it's not in the parent. You try to change the parent, you can't do it because the child records are there. They, they literally will, that's what referential integrity is for. It stops you from making changes that break the data. Because surrogate keys are a number that are defined at the beginning of the record being created, and they never change, because it has no real-world meaning, you'll never have this problem. Varkar join speeds. So, you guys remember doing joins last semester? Joins on integers are fast. Joins on characters are not fast. Why? Because it has to compare every character when it's doing the join. So if you're going, oh, key number 155, there's 155, that's quick. Computers are good at integers. Technically, computers only know integers. There's no such thing as decimal places inside computers. But, you know, if they're good at integers. Characters, it's like, oh, okay, we got a G, we got an A, we got a U, we got a D, got an R. And it's literally every single row, it has to start comparing all the characters. It's going to make the join slower because it has to work so much harder to, to match. Disadvantages of synthetic keys. Technically, there are disadvantages. Okay. And usually these are, again, back to the old crusty old database designers from the 70s that complain about this. First one is getting the next value. That used to be a big problem. Good news. Every database server that has been, that, that has been around for at least 20 years have automatic increments. MySQL has a, data has a modifier on its integer called auto increment. Postgres and Oracle have um, sequences. An integer and its default value is the next value of the sequence. To give you guys an idea what a sequence actually is, you go to a lineup, you grab a number like at the Service Ontario desk and you got your little piece of paper with your number on it. That's your number in the sequence. Nobody else gets to have that number. Somebody grabs the next number and the next number. That's how a sequence works. It's like a lap counter that can never go backwards. Other ones have other things, but you know that's essentially how they work. Extra indexes, and that's the only valid argument against surrogate keys. So let's say you have a table with five indexes and you're using a natural key. You have five indexes. If you're using a surrogate key, you're still gonna have those five indexes plus one for the primary key, because the primary key is always indexed. Therefore, you're gonna have n plus one. It adds always adds one extra index. So it takes up a little bit more disk space. Yay. It's the only valid disadvantage of a synthetic key. But realistically, is it something you need to worry about as a database designer or a server administrator? No. If you're running out of disk, disk space to hold a one megabyte index, you got bigger problems. Okay. So we've hit the end of this. Um, actually, this took me longer than I expected to. So I wouldn't even have time to do the normalization example I was going to do today, even if my throat wasn't starting to go on me. Um, so right now you guys are able to do up to lab four, just fine. Next week I'll cover the stuff you need for lab five. And I'll do the normalization example next week for uh, everybody's enjoyment. Um, and what's cool, I'll just let you guys know this. Uh, I got uh, Chad GPT to generate me an example. I haven't tried to solve it yet. So we were all going to get to experience it together. I asked it, I, got, I fit it specific parameters of what I wanted, and it came out with an example. Um, well, it's not really Chad GPT, it's Copilot, but same idea. Runs the same engine in the back end. So we all get to experience it together next week. This structure I decided to feed me. Um, outside of that, you guys are free to run. Uh, 
I'll see you guys in lab or not as applicable. That's it.